Thank you for coming, everybody. Uh, my name is Andrew Aronson. We had a little issue getting the uh, demo unit projecting up to the screen. They replaced the unit. I think we're all good. And that's good news because uh, we're planning on spending about 10 to 15 minutes covering some slides for you and 45 minutes showing you what the uh, deployment wizard and topology builder looks like. So without having you be able to see that on the screen, we'd be huddled over a laptop down here. So uh, let's hope that the screen stays good for us when we switch over. Welcome to uh, TechEd New Zealand. We're here to show you now the CS14 setup and deployment process. And so in this session, what we're going to cover is basically what you'll need software and hardware-wise for Communication Server 14. Uh, be aware that that's going to change potentially. We're all in, we're in pre-release candidate code even. So this is uh, the beta code, literally beta code, uh, not even the RC code yet. Uh, so not of our, our hardware sizing will be ready for you. Uh, so we'll show you what we have available today. Uh, but by RTM, we'll have a, additional or more robust hardware standards. We're also going to walk through all the planning tools that are available, and I'm going to cover that very high level of the slides, and we'll focus most of that on actually walking you through what these different planning tools look like. And uh, if the demo gods are smiling on us and we don't have any hiccups, we'll walk all the way through deploying an actual Enterprise Edition front-end server, end-to-end uh, -end from both the planning through the setup process itself. So let's start out. Uh, software requirements. Some of the things you'll need to deploy CS14 will be listed here. Uh, first of all, we only run CS14 on Windows Server 2008. You can run this either on R1 or on R2. If you're on R1, you need to upgrade to Service Pack 2 for 2008. The other caveat is that CS14 is 64-bit only. So that means that we do not have any 32-bit code for Communication Server 14. Meaning that, for example, if you have an admin workstation or a 32-bit box that you want to administer CS14 from, uh, you won't be able to install those PowerShell commandlets or add-ins on a 32-bit platform. We only have a 64-bit extension or the 64-bit plugins, so your client workstation that's doing the administration would need to be running a 64-bit OS. Uh, where we see the 64-bit issue is typically on that client workstation experience. Not all customers and partners have uh, uh, a build of 64-bit on their machines, but most hardware platforms, or almost, I think all hardware platforms now for the past few years, have been shifting a 64-bit build possible. We also have support for SQL 2005 and SQL 2008. Uh, you may be asking about SQL 2008 R2. We are in the testing matrices for that right now. Uh, we're anticipating having some story around support for SQL 2008 R2 closer to RTM or possibly shortly past RTM. So code bills today, uh, because we were doing testing before R2 had been released, have uh, been against 2005 and 2008, but we will see R2 added to that list over time. And uh, we do support, as we mentioned, Windows 7 as well as Windows Vista, uh, but that will have to be a 64-bit build of your workstation client. The one tool that is available as a 32-bit platform is the planning tool. So if any of you have deployed OCS 2007 R2, You'll notice that we deployed a planning tool wizard for it, which is basically an interview process that asks you questions about how many locations do you have, and in each location, how many people should be enabled for IM and presence, how many for conferencing, how many for enterprise voice, etc. And it would then build a topology for you with links to hardware guidance and sizing and everything else that's required to go through the deployment process. Uh, that planning tool is a, it will be updated for CS14, and will run on, uh, on a 32-bit uh, client as well. So if you have a 32-bit laptop or 32-bit desktop, you can run the planning wizard. And uh, as we'll show, there's some outputs you can take from that planning wizard to put into the 64-bit topology builder, which we're going to show you in this session. Finally, your forest and domain level, the minimum prereq there is uh, Windows Server 2003. As long as your Windows Server 2003 or higher, uh, today that would be 2003, 2008 R1, or 2008 R2 at your forest and domain functional level, uh, you're clear to go ahead and install OCS or CS14. We have a very limited hardware guidance story today, uh, primarily because the only scenario we're testing is the 100,000 clients connecting via admin presence. Uh, that leads us to a front end spec of 8 core, 16 gig of RAM for the front end servers and now we can see the front end server also can accommodate things like the AV conferencing role, the mediation server role. Uh, if you were to break those out, it would be a similar spec or similar type machine to the front end server role. 
Backend server is eight cores and 32 gigs of RAM. Uh, and the memory requirements for these came from sizing, as we said, a very large user profile against this. Uh, with 100,000 people, we're consuming around 13 gigabytes of RAM out of that 16 gigs, which means that we expect the sizing for RTM of CS14 to be significantly less than the hardware specs we're showing you now. Uh, the code is not yet optimized for performance. It's really still in the bug fixing stage. And so as we go from RC or to RC and from RC to RTM, uh, we'll be reducing the hardware specs required. And as well, as you would reduce, for example, the number of users testing against that system, we'll be significantly reducing the hardware specs around that. One other comment, uh, people ask the question around virtualization. Uh, virtualization is now fully supported for all CS14 roles, including audio, video, and conferencing, and other roles that were not supported in 2007 R2. We've done a lot of performance tuning inside of, the soft, inside of CS14 to accommodate for the latency that occurs when the packets hit a virtual NIC to when the packets get to the processor uh, to reduce the things like jitter and drop pa or, um, uh, dropped audio or dropped video packets, for example. So as we say, right, fully supported. Uh, all roles, including enterprise edition, standard edition, edge server roles, audio, video, conferencing, um, can be now virtualized. You can run that virtual guest on either Windows Server 2008 R2 or any virtualization vendor that's part of the SVVP, or Server Virtualization Validation Program. Uh, basically, the SVVP, you can think of as the hardware compatibility list for virtualization hypervisors. So when a vendor enters SVVP, we establish a support channel and legal framework with them. We're then able to escalate any issues. We run an exhaustive set of tests against that vendor's hypervisor kernel. Once they pass, we know we can run our applications on top of that without having any issues. The one caveat, as we mentioned there, is a survivable branch appliance. Uh, we'll cover more about detail of how those work this afternoon in the voice architecture portions. But the survivable branch appliance is a mix of both a mediation server role and some hardware or telephony circuit-based hardware or, or silicon, which means that you can actually plug in a digital line from your PBX or directly from a PSTN provider. And that is the reason that that type of appliance is not virtualizable. We don't have a way to plug in, for example, a, uh, a PSTN circuit into a virtual appliance. We also have a list of operating system component prereqs. Uh, as of now, several of these are required to be installed manually. However, we are optimizing that experience and expect that to be reduced by RTM and where the uh, RTM code will deploy many of these setup prereqs for you. Uh, there is a prereq validation checker. We'll show you that in the uh, deployment planning tool as well, which will walk through and determine which prereqs are installed and which ones have to be installed. In the demo environment I prepared for you, I have went through and installed this list of prereqs manually, primarily to save time in the demo experience. It can take about a half hour to 40 minutes just to go through and install the prerequisites, do the required reboots, et cetera, and get the machine to a sufficient state to accommodate the install. So in terms of pre-preparation, I went through the prerequisite list and installed the appropriate tools. We'll talk very briefly around the changes in setup employment. Uh, some of the issues that we saw in 2007 R2 was that configuration data, for example, is stored in various locations. You have some in Active Directory. Some of that configuration data for the pools, for example, is stored in SQL. Uh, and yet additional configuration data was accessed or stored via WMI. This made it relatively difficult to have a single method for interfacing or changing objects and parameters in 2007 R2. It also led to a little bit of confusion. As a result of that, we've changed our process for CS14 to move everything to what we call a central configuration database or management store. And we'll talk briefly about that in the next slide or two. Uh, but some other issues was around schema preparation, right? Some organizations we found that extending the schema was limited to maybe once or twice a year or on a quarterly update period. And if your project didn't align with one of those schedules, you faced a significant delay to extending the schema. So we tried to make some changes around as well in the CS14 to reduce the uh, number of times we'll have to update the schema both in intro introducing the product as well as in things like service packs. Uh, edge servers in R2 had no interface for pulling configuration data centrally. So you had to manage the edge configuration locally on each edge server, meaning that if you change an IP address or server name or configuration data internally, you also manually had to make that change out on edge. And finally, we had service accounts, which meant you had to deal with password changes and expiration. 
and pieces of, and uh, things of that nature. In CS14, everything now runs as network service, so we've removed the requirement around service accounts and having to change those passwords. The custom store, as we say, we now have a central management database. So instead of storing information, some in Active Directory, some in SQL, some by WMI, all configuration data, or server configuration data, and pool configuration data is stored in the central management store inside of your primary SQL database. There's one instance or primary copy of the central management store, and a copy of that is installed or is replicated to a copy of SQL Express on every CS14 server role you introduce. This simplifies your deployment dramatically. You now have two locations. Server and pool configuration information is stored inside of SQL. User configuration is stored inside of Active Directory. So whether a user is enabled or disabled for enterprise voice or for federation or what their SIP address is remains a user attribute on that user. But all other configuration information is stored inside of this topology document, which is just an XML file which is stored inside of your central management store uh, being a SQL database. As we said, each additional server that you deploy is going to have a copy of this database. And so that ensures that if the first server and the first pool that you deploy, central management store is unavailable, your OCS infrastructure, your CS14 infrastructure will continue to run because they each have a local replica of that. What you won't be able to do if that central management store is unavailable is make changes to your topology. So as long as your central management store is up, you can make changes to that. Changes will replicate out to other servers. We'll push those replicas to edge servers by HTTPS to reduce the number of ports you may have to open on your firewall. And so therefore, all CS14 servers in the org will be kept up to date with, us, uh, with what your master topology is. Uh, backwards compatibility. CS14 also will publish information to the existing SQL databases and Active Directory for compatibility with 2007 R2 or 2007 R1. Uh, this, the R1 and R2 servers expect to find configuration information in Active Directory, for example, so we're still going to publish a copy of what's in that configuration store to Active Directory for backwards compatibility. Uh, as we move forward with additional versions, we will eventually not have to publish that backwards compatibility, meaning that we'll have uh, schema extensions and things like that will be greatly reduced and or eliminated as we can update the schema of the central management database without having to update the schema inside of Active Directory. We mentioned this concept of the topology document. The topology document is literally a definition of all the servers, server names, IP addresses, ports, roles that are installed, etc., for all CS14 servers in your organization. Uh, we're going to walk through the topology builder in the demo, which makes it a little clearer what the topology document is, as well as go ahead and publish that document into Active Directory and the central management schema database, and then use that published topology to go ahead and deploy a server role. We do require SQL to publish the central management database to. So if you have an enterprise edition server, we also require SQL. That scenario is covered. But you may ask, if I'm only going to deploy a standard edition server and I want to leverage SQL Express, where will I publish this central management store to? And the answer there is we will actually create a single instance on SQL Express if you're deploying a, front, a standard edition server. We'll see that as well in the deployment wizard as we walk through the demo scenario. So, a quick brief overview on what the setup process looks like, and we'll show you, uh, we'll jump to the demo and walk through that. First of all, you have Active Directory. We do require an Active Directory infrastructure for CS14, and you'll have a computer that's joined out to that domain, and you'll use that computer to run forest prep, domain prep, and extend the schema in Active Directory with the new attributes required for CS14. Once that's complete, you'll install something called Topology Builder, Topology Builder lets you then create this topology. So Topology Builder gets installed. We can then either create a new topology in Topology Builder, uh, import our R1 or our R2 topology, for example, or we can take the output from the planning tool and import that into Topology Builder. So if we use the planning tool on our laptop, we can save the results, import that into Topology Builder, and then use that to actually create our topology. So we make any modifications as required, once done, we then publish the topology that will push a copy of that topology or that topology.xml file into our central management store, which is over on SQL. 
If it's the first time we're doing this, we're going to have to actually create that database. You'll see the, uh, that process as well in the Topology Builder demo. Uh, if it's already there, we're going to update the existing topology that's in that tool. Once we've deployed the topology to SQL, we can then take our computer accounts that will have the CS14 roles installed on, whether those are physical or virtual instances, and run a special mini setup on those boxes. Those boxes will run setup, which is a local copy called OCS Core. That OCS Core will look up inside of the central management database inside of SQL, determine what server roles are supposed to be installed because that box has a server name and IP address that will match something in that topology document and will then retrieve the topology and run through the remaining pieces of setup to install the appropriate components. So if we set it to be an enterprise edition front-end server and we set it to co-locate the AV conferencing and the mediation server role, all three of those roles will be installed and configured on that server without any checkboxes or interaction required on our part. We'll then activate, uh, if it's a front-end server or an enter enterprise edition server, we do have to go through the certificate process. We've made some extensive changes on the certificate wizard as well, uh, which we'll also show you in the walkthrough. Later on, eventually you'll need to renew or possibly update those certificates. You can always run that process after the fact. It will update your server uh, and the uh, services will continue to run. So, main screen, uh, we're not going to show you this in the demo because we've already extended the schema for Active Directory, ran the forest prep, and ran the domain prep, but you can see those options on the prepare AD portion. You can also see that prepare first standard edition servers grayed out. That's because in this instance, we have not yet prepared the AD schema, so we don't have the option to do that. But uh, running prepare first standard edition server allows us to just deploy a standard edition server with the appropriate roles on the specific server that we're running this document. If we're going to be deploying an enterprise server, we want to publish a topology. In that case, we'll need a SQL database to house that topology and other portions. Prepare AD, once you click on the app box, you'll see a screen like this, which is very similar. Prep schema, prep forest, prep current domain. Each one of those will have a log that you can view after completion to validate that that process completed successfully. Uh, we also have a set of PowerShell commandlets. If you want to delegate or allow your Active Directory team to run the schema preparation, force prep, and domain prep, you can give them the PowerShell commandlets. They're able to go off and run that on their own. With that, uh, let's switch over to the demo. And I believe I have to ask our friends over on the, oops, I'm in suspend mode, or standby mode. Uh, our friends over here for that process. Can we get the uh, screen switch to demo? Uh, demo screen? Yep, thanks. <clears throat> and actually, let's put some power up here as well. In the rush to get the screen going. We have no power. And we are up. So, what we have here is a basic lab environment. We have four computers in this lab, or in the uh, lab that's running. Uh oh, come on. I'll wait for the reconnection to come up. All right. So four computers. We have a Windows Server 2003 domain controller called Tail-DC. Uh, we have a box, Tail-CS14-Mon. This box currently has SQL Server 2008 R2 installed. It also has the uh, deployment wizard, uh, which is the first piece of setup installed as well, just to save a couple of minutes. There's a blank front-end server, and there's a blank enterprise edition server. Uh, these have the prerequisites installed, but don't have any other information from the REA, uh, any other server roles, etc. installed. So let's go to our monitoring slash SQL box and show you what this deployment wizard or topology builder looks like. So we're going to launch Topology Builder. And we'll wait a moment for that to come up. And in Topology Builder, we're going to validate that we don't have any information published out to Active Directory today. Uh, the first thing we're going to try to do is download an existing topology in Active Directory or download from an existing deployment. So if we select Download and hit OK, uh, it will attempt 
it will query Active Directory, it will look for an SCP record or service connection point, which would point to where that central management store database is held. However, since that is not published yet to Active Directory, we're not able to locate that, and we can see that we don't have any current published topology to Active Directory. So we're going to go ahead and create a new topology. So we'll click on New Topology. The first thing it has us do is save a local copy as well. So we'll call this the Auckland Focus. Auckland, we can spell Auckland correctly, Auckland Central Site. Uh, it'll ask us for a primary SIP domain. In this case, we're in tailspintoys.com, so we'll call it tailspin.com. And if we have additional SIP domains that are supported by your users, we can go ahead and enter those additional SIP domains on this page and add them in. In our case, we'll go ahead with a single SIP domain of tailspin.com. Each deployment that we're going to deploy to must have a, at least one central site. And we can define additional central sites. A central site would be a, a site that has a pool, whether that be a standard edition pool or an enterprise edition pool, and has additional infrastructure such as conferencing MCUs, possibly PSTN gateways, things of that nature. So we have one concept or construct called a central site, and we have another one called a branch office site. We'll show you the setup process for both of those. But let's go ahead and create a site for Auckland. So we'll call this Auckland and the Auckland Central Site. Our city is Auckland. State province is North Island. And country is New Zealand. So once my topology is created, by default, it will also ask me to go ahead and launch the new front-end wizard, which will allow me to create a pool and all of the characteristics associated with a pool inside of CS14. So I click Next, and it starts the front-end wizard pool. So let's click Next here. And the first thing that we do with uh, OCS, or CS14, is we have this concept of a pool and a name associated with it. The name is what clients will attempt to connect to. So if I have a CS14 communicator client, or I have one of the phones that Paul demoed for us or showed us the other day, uh, those clients will issue a DNS query to find out their pool name. Once they have their pool name, they'll get an IP address or uh, in CS14, a set of servers potentially associated with that pool and attempt to make a connection or a registration. So let's give our pool, we'll call it pool1.tailspin.com. And in this case, we're going to deploy an enterprise edition front-end pool, uh, basically so we can show you some of the characteristics or options associated with the enterprise edition boxes. So computer FQDN, uh, what are the computer names in the pool? We've created a computer account called tail-cs14-ee.tailspin.com. And we only have one that we're going to deploy. We could deploy up to 10, for example. Uh, as required around capacity or redundancy. Our next option includes the ability really to define what we want to co-locate on those servers. So if we want to host on our front-end servers things like conferencing, enterprise voice, or bandwidth management, these are features that we would choose to click now. Uh, we're going to deploy all. Our users will have conferencing, dial-in conferencing. They will have enterprise voice, meaning that they have the capacity to make calls to and from the PSTN. And uh, we're also going to deploy a bandwidth management for our choice of uh, uh, CAC. Now we have the choice of whether or not we want to co-locate additional server roles on this front-end server. So as we saw, and uh, if you look on the performance side, and right now we're saying that if you have up to 10,000 users inside of your pool, uh, go ahead and co-locate AV conferencing and potentially as well the mediation server role. Uh, the capacity of a 8-core box or 16-core box is more than enough uh, to run this. We'll talk later this afternoon about something called Media Bypass and how that offloads a lot of the processing involved on the mediation server role today. Uh, but basically what that means is we can now begin to co-locate significantly more roles, which means that our simplest deployment for a central site is either a standard edition server with all the roles co-located or 
two enterprise edition servers if we wanted HA with all those roles co-located and no additional roles required to uh, uh, present CS14 functionality. So we'll co-locate. Uh, in our case, we're also going to check enable monitoring because we have a monitoring server. Uh, as we're deploying enterprise voice, we'd like to capture some of what we call the call detail records. And call detail records is a very rich collection of attributes about each call that takes place. Everything from endpoint configuration to bandwidth to drop packets to the perception of audio quality so that we can track how our voice performance is inside of our organization. We'll hit next. Uh, we have not yet in our central site defined a SQL server. So we need to define what our SQL store is. Our SQL server instance is installed on tail-cs14-mon, uh, tailspin.com. And we'll go ahead and use the default instance on there uh, because we don't have anything else accessing or using that SQL store yet. We're going to also create a file share. Uh, this is where our meeting content and other pieces will be stored. So let's go ahead and call. Uh, we're going to co-locate our file share on our CS14 monitoring server, tailspin.com. And we'll call this one Auckland file share. Uh, let's go ahead and create that Auckland file share because we don't have one yet. So we'll make a new folder called Auckland file share and go ahead and share that out. And sharing, share, permissions, give everyone full control. Hit OK, hit close. So next. The next option we have is around the URLs that will be uh, used for our pool. There's the concept of an internal base URL and an external base URL. Where this comes into play is whether or not we're going to be accessing our pool using an HTTP based client. If we're only using a CS14 client, the CS14 client is now aware of all of the servers inside of the pool and so therefore does not need a hardware load balancer between our enterprise edition servers. It will uh, learn via DNS all the servers in the pool, randomly select one of those servers to join first. If that's unavailable, it will continue to try the others. If the server it's leveraging fails, it will try one of the other resources. This removes the requirement for hardware load balancing for a pure CS14 and or smart endpoints deployment. If, however, we want to deploy something like uh, communicator web access, we will need to deploy a hardware load balancer as the web browser client has no capacity to determine additional endpoints or additional methods of access. So in our case, eventually maybe we'll deploy a web balancer, so we'll need to segment out, uh, we'll call this web, web internal and web external. Uh, so that we have a separate URL basically for our web clients compared to our CS14 clients. We hit next. Uh, we have the option to define a PSTN gateway. This comes up because we selected the enterprise voice option. So let's assume that we have a gateway called PSTN1.tailspin.com. We can see that we can define both the port and the IP address associated with that gateway as well as whether we're going to use TCP or TLS. We'll hit next. Uh, we don't have any monitoring servers defined yet, but we'll go ahead and define one. So we'll hit new. Our monitoring server FQDN is tail-cs14-mon.tailspin.com. And we're going to leverage the current SQL store for our monitoring server instance, as well as the default instance of that, uh, instead of defining a new one just to save some time. We'll hit finish. And we've now created our topology for CS14. Uh, if I plus out the topology, you'll see that I have a central site called Auckland, and I have all the configuration information or parameters there. Before we walk through, we are going to see if this, uh, we need to reset the demo or not. When we hit publish topology, we have approximately an 85% chance that will work, and a 15% chance it's going to come back with a DNS not available. In that case, we reset to one of our um, uh, snapshots in Hyper-V, and we'll be able to quickly resume where we left off. So, published topology, it will launch a little wizard. In the published topology, we're both going to provision the database instance inside of SQL, as well as publish the location of that database instance in an SCP record. We have a little published wizard. We'll hit next. Uh, the database that we want to create, the is is, information is there. And we have two options. 
we can let CS14 go to your SQL server and determine the drives that are attached to it and which one would be best for databases and which one would be best for logs based on performance and capacity requirements. Or, if our SQL administrators have defined those paths for the specific instance, we can leverage what's defined in SQL. Leveraging this will save us a little bit of time, so we'll click the SQL instance defaults. Uh, the front end pool that will host the central management store, by default, it's the first pool you define. If I wanted a separate pool to do that, I could create pool two or pool five, for example, before I publish the topology and select that additional pool to host the central management store. Let's hit next again. And here's where we find out. And it's a good thing that that next button is paused for a while. Like I said, about uh, two or three times out of 11 or 12, it comes back and says that there's a DNS error. There isn't a DNS error, but that's what you get when you're working with the uh, beta refresh code. We're in good shape. So once this starts, you'll see now that we start provisioning the uh, database objects inside of SQL, and we will copy all of that topology information that we just defined into that SQL instance. So while that's provisioning, let's go over and take, oops, did I, and when I created my file share, I must have, uh, I must have clicked the wrong box. It will still work regardless of that, but let's go back and validate that. Permissions. Oh, I thought I did. All right. We'll watch that fix through. And let's go back and take a look at one of the other boxes in our organization, which is our Tailspin CS14 Enterprise Edition server role. So right now, this is a vanilla install of Windows Server 2008 R2. Like I said, I've went through and installed the prerequisites. We can take a quick look at that. Let's uh, see what we have installed on this box. We can go to Control Panel, Programs and Features, Programs, Programs and Features. And we have URL rewrite module, Visual C++. We also have some of the prereqs. And we have the I can show you the core components for CS14 installed on this box as well. That's the basically the deployment wizard tool. So if I can go to this server and launch the deployment wizard, I will come up and it will check to see a is there any core is there any uh, CS14 server role components installed on this box? If so, then I know where things like the central management store and I can find out if there's been any changes to the topology. If not, let's go out and find that central management store and determine what specifically is supposed to be installed. So while that's coming up, let's go back and check the status of our publish. And we can see that our publish has completed. Uh, enabling topology has a warning. Let's just check that one. Let's match. OK. We logs. We'll take a look at what specifically happened with that portion. Now we can see that in this case, one of them came back with a warning. That's allow me to display the block content. And we'll see what happened there. So get global activation. We have an error on global service activation, activate service. And we had an issue with the file share. Uh, there were some errors associated with that. We're aware, and that's not an issue. And we can see that these are file share service related. So if you had some issues creating the file share, we can go back and fix that problem. We are going to, uh, we know that those are NTFS permission errors, but we would like to show you what happens when a specific component fails and how you troubleshoot that with the logs. Other than that, we can complete, we click finish, and we will see inside of here our central topology and that other information. Now that it's published, we can go to the enterprise edition server role. We see that prepare active directory is complete. Uh, this server yet doesn't know if it's supposed to be a standard edition or an enterprise edition server role, so we also have the option to prepare the first standard edition server. We could do things like install topology builder if we wanted to customize or modify the topology uh, information from this specific server instance. What we really want to do is install or update our communication server 14 server role information. So we'll select that option. We will wait as it validates the deployment state and determines that uh, nothing here is installed yet. It takes a moment or two. And we can see that because 
no CS14 server roles are installed, the first option or install local configuration server is highlighted or is available. This means that we don't have a copy of SQL Express running on this box that's populated with that CS14 topology document, which will allow me to go ahead and deploy CS14 on the specific box. So let's go ahead and start this process because this will install SQL Express. Uh, that SQL Express installation tends to take about 10 minutes. So while it's going through that installation, we'll switch back and we'll walk through that topology builder configuration and do things like add a branch site as well as validate other aspects of our existing CS14 deployment model. So in this case, we're going to try to retrieve the configuration directly from our central management store. We'll click on next. And now the box will go ahead and query Active Directory, get the SCP record, find the SCP record points to our CS14-mon, uh, our tail-CS14-mon, get the information out of SQL, and, uh, which is just completed. So now it asks for the path of the installation files. I have a drive mounted with CS14. So set up AMD, set up, open, and next. And you'll see that there's no other parameters I define on this box. At this point, it's going to go through, validate all the prerequisites are there, and then uh, go ahead and install SQL Express. So the last item here is SQL Express RTC Local. You'll see installing. And like I said, that's going to run for about five to 10 minutes. We'll bring this up on the left side of the pane so we can kind of keep track of the status as we're moving through. And we'll come back over to our CS14 Mon and see if we can uh, walk you through what Topology Builder looks like. So we've defined a central site called Auckland. In Auckland, we can see that we don't have any standard edition server roles yet, uh, but we do have enterprise edition front end pool. That pool name is pool1.tailspin.com. Uh, it has, uh, right now, a single server defined inside of that pool. Uh, we're about to go through and deploy that server. But we can also see information such as what pools and features and functionality are enabled on this pool1.tailspin.com. Uh, so we can see I am in presence, conferencing, uh, PSDN conferencing, enterprise voice are all configured here. Uh, the associations or prereqs that this pool has, so things such as SQL, the file store, whether or not an archiving server is associated with it. And we can modify this information. So later on, if we need to change a SQL database or we want to change some properties, we can uh, right click on that and click on edit and we can see a list of all the options that we would change. So if we had an additional, if we wanted to change a file share, we could do that. Uh, did I share it out as Auckland file share? Let me just make sure I... Auckland file share, it appears so. Pardon? Ah, thank you, I see what happened. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> That's what I did wrong. So uh, let's go ahead and fix this issue. We'll go inside of our guest. The 1024 by 720 resolution threw me off. So inside of the guest, we can go to the C drive, we can create a new folder. We'll call that Auckland file share, and we'll go ahead and share that out. Uh, sharing, advanced sharing, and permissions, and allow, okay, close. Now, we can see our file share is there. Uh, monitoring server edge pool. Uh, later this afternoon, we're also going to talk about some of the resiliency options inside of CS14. Uh, what we have for basic resiliency or the ability to do some HA and site resilience is a concept of a backup registrar. So if I have more than one pool, or in the simplest scenario, I have two separate standard edition servers, each hosting half of my users, I can set the backup registrar to the other server in the organization. That ensures that CS14 clients, if their primary pool is unavailable, will switch to their backup registrar, create a registration, and begin providing some services inside of the organization. Because we only have a single pool, uh, we don't have a backup registrar uh, configured yet in this organization. We can see everything from mediation server, ports and uh, gateways, etc. required, names and IP addresses, all the pieces inside of the organization. So let's cancel out of our pool settings. We'll go back. We have the option of creating director pools uh, where we can use that for authenticating and pre-authenticating connections coming in from Edge and or providing a single point internally for registrations. Uh, an AV conferencing pool, which is leveraging the same configuration information. 
The SQL store, which you saw us create, and we can see the properties of that SQL database and which pieces depend on it. File store, mediation pools, you can see we have that's also co-located in pool1.tailspin.com. The PSTN gateway, or gateways that are associated, monitoring servers, archiving servers, our edge servers, and finally, the concept of branch sites, right? So let's assume that we have another location uh, that has a smaller number of users, maybe 30 or 50 or so, and we want to deploy one of these survivable branch appliances to that location and use that survivable branch appliance to ensure that that location retains the ability to place and receive telephone calls even when the LAN connection fails. So with new branch site, I can click new branch site. Uh, we'll say that this is in Wellington. We'll call this the Wellington branch site. And it's in Wellington. That's in South Island, New Zealand. I was asking someone earlier, is there actually, does New Zealand have states and provinces? Pardon? No, and so I, I was, is it just state Wellington on that side, or is it North Island, South Island? The person's like, well, I think it's North Island, South Island, so. Pardon? <laughs> Oh, well, I thought Wellington was on the South Island. Am I wrong there? Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> that will fail. Well, hopefully it fails in this location and not for, our, not for our publishing. So we'll call the state Wellington. We'll keep everything here on the North Island. Sorry to offend everyone there from the South Island. Uh, next and finish. And the next option is to launch then that survivable branch appliance configuration portion. So one of the advantages in CS14 is when you populate something like a survivable branch appliance, we'll actually go ahead and keep that configuration inside that central management database. And as you make changes, it will automatically get pushed out to the SBA so you don't have to manage and configure that individually for all the locations you have SBAs deployed. So we'll hit finish. Now we have the concept of the SBA. We'll call this sba1.tailspin.com. And uh, front end pool, which pool is this SBA going to be associated with? This would be the backup registrar as well for that location. If I had an edge pool in my organization, I could also specify which edge pool the users at the, at, at the, uh, at the branch location are for uh, and what PSDN. We'll say there's a PSTN2.tailspin.com uh, that's located at that location. And it, next. So now I can see that I've defined a branch site. The branch site obviously has a small subset of information that's stored in the primary site. So what I have there is the concept of survivable branch servers, which in this case is an SBA, uh, as well as a mediation pool, which is the mediation server role running on that survivable branch appliance, and a PSTN gateway, which is PSTN2 at that location. This will allow Wellington then to retain functionality in the case of a WAN outage. Users that are homed on that survivable branch appliance will then make a call to the SBA. That SBA would route the call out over a, a traditional circuit that's attached directly to that survivable branch appliance. As I'm finishing up with this, I can see over on the left that our configuration or installation of SQL Express on the uh, uh, Enterprise Edition server role we're about to deploy is completed, and we now copied or brought down a replica of our central management store into that instance of SQL Express. I could view the logs if I wanted to, but I see that it's completed successfully, so we'll go ahead and click Finish. And the next piece is then, now I can run set up or remove communication server components. So by running this, it will look at that local configuration, determine uh, all the parameters in terms of which server roles to deploy. I, I co-located the AV conferencing as well as mediation server. So all those services will be deployed to this Enterprise Edition box. The prereq check, will ki pre check kicks off. We can see all the prereqs are installed, and we can see the Windows installer comes up to begin installing all the server components required on this Enterprise Edition box. It runs through relatively quickly. We'll give it a moment or two to finish up here. Uh, the visual Java Sharp 2.0 is coming down. Um, and in that time period, we're going to do a quick, well, let's let the live demo run, and then we'll uh, show you the last couple slides. The last couple slides bring up a couple of options. Some of you may have noticed that the uh, concept of user accounts has changed. We don't have service accounts in CS14. We now use something called network service or something running individually or a local context on these machines. 
The impact of using network service and not a service account is that we can't do something or we can't authenticate using Kerberos. We authenticate using NTLM when we're using network service because if we have more than one Enterprise Edition server in a pool, we need a unique SPN registration for each of those. We do have an option. There's a PowerShell command out that will allow you to basically provision and enable a set of accounts leveraged to allow Kerberos authentication to your Enterprise Edition boxes inside of a pool. So though by default it will be NTLM, uh, we do give you the capacity to go ahead and enable or configure your uh, Enterprise Edition pool to allow for Kerberos authentication. Uh, today it's a PowerShell commandlet. Uh, we're looking at possibly making that a wizard by RTM. Uh, we should know a little bit more about that as that completes. We can see by looking up on here that uh, we've installed quite a few components, right? So as we look down the list, we can see app servers, our conferencing attendance service, uh, the data MCU management server, mediation server, response group service, the server.msi. So we see all the individual components installed on this, are being installed on this enterprise edition server as we specified inside of that topology.xml file or inside a topology builder. So in another moment or two, this should complete and we'll be able to show you the certificate planning wizard, which is the final piece of the demo. Let's give it another minute or two. So Wellington is on the North Island? I thought Wellington was on the South. I got my geography wrong on that one. I apologize. So, <laughs> uh, OCS MCU, we're nearly complete on our uh, installation of the server components. I knew it was on the South side. I just thought it would cross the border into the other. Uh, so what's on the South? Christchurch is on the South Island. Uh, Queenstown, South Island. So I used one of those names in the demo and had a known confirmation. If that's the worst failure we've got, I think we've been pretty lucky so far. Uh, as we've done this demo, I, like I said, about three or four times out of 12, it's had to fail and we've had to step back and redo some of the processes from the saved snapshots. So let's uh, let this complete. All right, so now we can see the server roles have been deployed. We enable CS Computer. We now have an Enterprise Edition server activated and deployed inside of our topology. So we'll click on finish. The next piece to this will be to assign the certificates required. Uh, if you're, as you're aware, if you're not aware, all communication server to server, client to server, and server to gateway inside of OCS, as well as CS14, is encrypted. Meaning that we either use TLS or TCP with a certificate, to or MTLS, to ensure that any bits on the wire, whether that's voice traffic, conferencing traffic, video traffic, etc., is going over an encrypted session. So by now, we don't have any certificates installed. We can see that there's none assigned. But let's go ahead and request a certificate for our box. Uh, I have deployed certificate services or the certificate authority on my 2003 domain controller. So we're going to use that internal CA to press this certificate. So we'll send a request immediately to the online CA. The CA, we have one on the list, which is DC01. We'll click on Next. Uh, we don't need to specify any al alternate credentials. I signed in using the administrator account. Uh, the, also, in some organizations, you may need to define a separate certificate request template. Uh, for us, the default web server template will suffice. So we'll click on Next. Our friendly name will be Tailspin CS14 Certificate. We will mark this as exportable. If I choose to deploy additional servers in my pool, I might want to export the certificate and import that to the other servers in the pool. Organization is Tailspin. And organizational unit will be IT. Country region will be New Zealand. There we go. State province, in this case, we're in Auckland. And Auckland. So, now it'll show us by default what we're going to populate for both our subject name as well as the subject alternate names. All of these namespaces come from our topology document. So we define in our topology document, it knows from our topology what namespaces need to be associated with that certificate. Of course, we might have additional namespaces. Our subdomain is tailspin. Perhaps we have an external URL, for example, that we want our external web users to uh, use when they access it, we could add those additional certificate namespaces here, in which case those would be added to our certificate request. We won't. We'll use the default ones that are required. Uh, click on Next, and we will request the certificate. 
from the DC-01. That takes a moment or two while we create the certificate request and submit it to DC-01. It should only take a moment. And once back, we will have a certificate that we can use for our Enterprise Edition box. Once we have the certificate, the next step will be to go ahead and assign that certificate to the specific roles that are required. Uh, we have a wizard for that assignment policy as well, which is, uh oh, error constructing. Let's go back to uh, three errors. Let's see what happened in our log there. Certificate request normally uh, does have an issue on occasion, but we do have a snapshot prior to this in case this fails. So we'll take a quick look. allow our uh, block content to occur. And see what happens with our certificate request. Error occurred. Ah, uh, yeah. That's our certificate exception. And we have our dreaded stack trace. All right. So let's, uh, we're going to try just briefly a certificate request one more time to see if that goes through. If not, we'll uh, revert to a snapshot, which allows us to go forward on this portion. And same process. All right. Let's uh, confirm it's not there. We'll go ahead and close. And if you'll give me a moment, we're going to apply our snapshot for the certificate wizard. So let's apply on our domain controller. We'll apply it to our SQL slash monitoring box. And so now, even though it says CS14-mon, right, all that's installed on there is SQL 2008 plus the uh, topology builder tool. Uh, we would actually have to go through CS14 setup to deploy the monitoring server role onto this specific server. That's almost restored. And let's restore our certificate wizard snapshot as well. Thankfully, we have some snapshots in here for the beta code, or uh, it could take us a while to go all the way from the beginning to get to certificates again. Seventy-three. Yes, so uh, good question. So the uh, question is, what about migrating from R1 or R2 to CS14? And so I have good news for you and I have bad news for you. The good news is that you can migrate from either OCS 2007 R1 or OCS 2007 R2. The bad news is you cannot migrate from both R1 and R2 directly to CS14. Uh, as of right now in the, in the uh, release cycle for CS14. This is something that may be changed by RTM. We have no confirmation on that, but the current feedback is that it's an either-or scenario to migrate to. Uh, the migration process is fairly simple. It's very si similar to what you went through from R1 to R2, but with the introduction of Topology Builder. All right, while we're uh, uh, at that point, let's see. Let's make sure we have our components installed. Actually, that's already completed. We'll go right to the certificate wizard. Um, the migration process for R1 and R2 was to build new parallel infrastructure and move users from one pool to your new R2-related pool. That concept is the same for CS14. You would deploy a CS14 server using the topology builder like I did here, and then change the associated pool from a user from either your R1 pool to, or your R2 pool to the new CS14 pool. Uh, Let's go ahead and start the certificate wizard again for you so you can see what that looks like. We'll do the request process. And now that's requesting, we'll give you some more background on the migration portions. The new piece to the CS14 integration with R1 or R2 is that in Topology Builder, and we'll go back to show that as it does the request here. Oops, we don't need alternate credentials. My bad. Sorry. Uh, so alternative certificate templates. No. We'll use Marcus Exportable. Next, 
Tailspin, Australia, uh, Sydney. Oops, that was where uh, we did the demo last. Tailspin.com. Next. No subject alternate names. Next. Uh, so in CS14 and Topology Builder, you have the choice to import your R1 or R2 topology so that you're aware of that, so you can see that R1 and R2 topology. You won't be able to modify or make changes of your R1 or R2 topology in Topology Builder, but what that gives you is your Topology Builder document having a full list of all your configurable items. And so things such as gateways, we could leverage using CS14 or R1 or R2, for example, uh, as we define them inside of Topology Builder. Oh, we have the same problem. Let's take a look on DC01 and see if all of our services are running. The common one here would be things like services uh, or the um, certificate service not running. Let's see if that's our issue. And this might be as simple as a log on log off as well. Let me confirm. Features, diagnostics, configuration. Services. Every once in a while, the certificate service fails to start on uh, boot. Certificate propagation is running. Standard view. Start type. Automatics are all up. All right. So let me do the same process, but specify different credentials on a cert wizard and see if that allows us to get the uh, portion running. Enterprise edition. Request. Next. Send the request now. Tailspin. We'll say tail. And next. 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 Yeah, that's our that's our next uh, next choice here. That's not what I wanted to get to. Oh, this automatically this is uh I think our request wizard in beta refresh will only allow us to do online requests. Um, pardon? Or did it have the uh, option to? Oh, yep, thank you. You're right. Specify the full path. We'll call that uh, cert rec. Oops. Well, can a template not required? Tailspin. And uh, the environment now is configured for Australia, so we're going to leave the Australian one on there. Did I click the yep, Tailspin zip domain? Request is complete. Let's go ahead and try issuing that certificate. So, DC one, sorry, tail dash DC. Where's our close on? Okay, I think so. Uh, This would be well. I think we're running low on time, so I may not be able to get you the certificate portions there. 
Um, I apologize for not being able to show that. I'm not sure why my cert portion is going, but we're also close on time. So I'll, instead of showing you cert wizards, we'll show you the, uh, or I can take questions if you guys have any questions on setup and deployment that we didn't already cover. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, so uh, one edge server, one CS14 edge server infrastructure will be able to handle requests for both an R2 or an R1 pool as well as your... Uh, question is, can you leverage the same edge server infrastructure for CS14 as well as existing pools? And the answer to that is you can share a single edge infrastructure, an R2 edge infrastructure for... R, uh, a CS14 edge infrastructure for R1 or R2 plus CS14 pools. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, a question. I think I see where you're going. Uh, the question is uh, to migrate to CS14. What are your migration path options? It's either R1 to CS14 or R2 to CS14. We don't support a, at this point in time. We don't support a hybrid R1 slash R2 going to CS14. So if you have a small R2 deployment, it's probably backtracked to R1. If you've uh, got one or two R1 servers left, it's complete migrating those to R2 before you go to CS14. Question. Uh, you couldn't get to a single, so you couldn't get to a single physical box if you want both a CS14 infrastructure and Edge. Your minimum deployment would be two, an Edge server plus a CS14 standard edition or single enterprise edition box inside. But you can run everything on a single enterprise edition box inside for services. The one thing we wouldn't co-locate would be monitoring and archiving, which is a separate server role still. Question. Uh, for the edge, do you still have to publish the web shares and stuff as well? Uh, no, the edge server is going to be your conferencing, or I mean your, your input for SIP registrations and possibly for media paths, depending on whether or not there's going to be audio, video, or conferencing. Um, if you do want your external attendees to see things like meeting content, etc., uh, that would get published via a reverse proxy server. So there will be a conference URL and, and file share, etc., for meeting content inside, and you'd publish that through a reverse proxy box, not through your edge infrastructure box. Correct, for address book downloads as well. So the, the edge, is, it still remains just your um, endpoint registration for clients, so for SIP registrations and media path, any publishing of things like address book or uh, meeting content would come through a reverse proxy type solution. Yes. Correct, correct. So the, the public IAM connectivity, the question is around public IAM connectivity. Uh, you still have to go through the same process of requesting that uh, 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 capability and then setting up the federation on your edge infrastructure to those third-party endpoints. I think right now the licensing for edge is now free for Hotmail and Yahoo. Am I correct on that? So, right. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, the communicator web access role is now part of your front end. So we now have the ability to have that content coming on our front end. We don't have a separate or dedicated. You, you may have saw that there was no uh, web access role in Topology Builder. That web access component is running on your either your standard edition or one of your enterprise edition server roles. So to simplify your deployment. All right, uh, one more to take. Uh, the topology builder, when it pulls it from R2, it's going to pull it from various locations because some of the configuration data is in your SQL. You'll specify that SQL store. Uh, some of the configuration is in an Active Directory, which we can read indirectly. So it pulls it in from the various locations, and some is in WMI, various locations from R2, for example, or from R1 uh, for that process. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, we'll cover in depth more the voice portions in the two voice sessions this afternoon, uh, both how to integrate with the PBX and the concepts such as media bypass and other features. On um, the second one will be the HA features and all the changes around that.
in CS14.